program. What you talking about? The program. The program. Get with the program. Everybody clap to this. Say what? Get with the program. It starts now. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Get With The Program Radio Show. I'm your host, Gary Jones. Now, Get With The Program Radio Show is a multicultural, informative, relevant, and entertaining one-hour weekly show offer you a combination of diverse interviews with questions and comments. And as always, we will act as a positive source of information. Now, listen, if you want to be a guest on the show, all you have to do is call 919-665-1118. Again, the number is 919-665-1118. Or hit me on the cell, 919-255-2757. Today we're going to be joining a conversation with Talisha Taylor. Talisha is an advocate for justice, make no mistake. And today we're going to talk about law enforcement accountability. We're going to touch a lot of that. We're going to find out from her perspective what she see about uh, law enforcement accountability. And also she has written an act and we're going to talk about that as well. Hello, Talisha. Welcome to the show. Hi, how you doing, Gary? I'm doing fine. How about yourself? Pretty good. Okay. I see you've been busy keeping up with you. Very much so. Yeah, yeah. You know, we... So now, T, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I was born and raised there. I attended Lincoln University. I was laser and Lincoln Aerospace Engineering Recruitment, recruitment Program mm-hmm. participant. Mm-hmm. So I have a bachelor's degree in physics and I went into education. So my master's degree is in education and education supervision as well. Hmm, physics, one of my worst class. <laughs> I, I couldn't stand physics. I didn't do very well in physics, but I, I commend you. You got through it. Mm. Those measurements, all that stuff, oh, madness. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> all right. So let's talk about police accountability, you know, because that's obviously something that you have a passion for to, to make sure there's some things that are taken care of. The LEA Act. Let's get right into that. The act. You've written an act that you want to get passed uh, through Congress. We want to get this heard and seen and, and uh, of course, uh, uh, accepted. Tell me about that. Uh, This summer, I was a participant in the protest um, involving the George Floyd Act, and I ran into a lot of my students. I run the Black Student Union at Enlo Magnet High School, and they were very vocal in how they felt, and um, a lot of us have experienced either firsthand or secondhand Um, know someone who has been a victim of police brutality. And as I was marching at the march, I kind of felt that there was no true message. Yes, Mm -hmm. we say Black Lives Matter. We've been saying Black Lives Matter for years, holding our hands up, hands up, don't shoot. And there has not been any real change. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized what the problem was. Marching and telling, they already understand what's right and what's wrong. But what we were lacking was actually the laws, ways to prosecute, ways to look at individuals and hold them accountable for their individual acts. I looked at some of the things that came out of it. The aid is great, the police reform, and nothing really held them fully accountable. So the purpose of the LEA Act is to be a comprehensive approach, and a lot of them lack that comprehensive approach. So today I'm going to introduce you to my act so that you can understand why this covers everything. First, we want to establish um, law enforcement as a profession. And by doing that, we want to hold them accountable and require them to get a professional license. And when you think about it, um, you have doctors, they have licensure. You even have cosmetologists that have licensure. Any profession that deals with people and um, anything that is misconduct or lack of neglect, will hurt people Mm -hmm. but we have police officers who actually have the decision and hold an an accountability for people's lives and we're not holding them up to that level of a standard Mm -hmm. so i want to incorporate a um, professional license establish a national standard for all law enforcement agencies because every agency every um state police officer local county they're holding themselves to their own standards and we need it to be across the board so there's no misunderstanding we want to establish a national database that way we don't have these incidents where you have officers just leaving one 
um, district to go to another. We need to have everything on a national database. And then we want to clearly define areas of misunderstanding between law enforcement officers and their subjects. Um, and I'm going to go into detail for all of this, but uh, and why I wrote every single piece. And finally, we want to streamline the federal law to prosecute excessive force and establish independent prosecutors because most of these cases are being held in house. So unfortunately, the results are not something that people are actually accepting or be, they're not being fair with their results. Mm -hmm. Now, when we say license for the police officers, what are we what are we talking about here? Okay, so the first thing we want to do is set up um, the Department of Justice, the DLJ needs to set up a licensure, and it needs to cover quite a few things. Number one is DLG training and professional development. And during that training, it's things that we kind of expect the police officers to know, but we're realizing based, in, based on every action to these cases, it's just not happening. They need to demonstrate knowledge of the laws. We're looking at people being arrested for laws that sometimes don't even exist in those counties, and we need to hold them accountable for that. In addition to that um, de-escalation training, sometimes they're the part or they're the person involved in the escalation of the event, and it doesn't really have to get um it doesn't have to get to that level so what you're saying there's a like in de-escalation is what that's there's a like in that there's not someone in here to keep this from escalating exactly for example if i'm talking to you you're raising your voice you're getting upset look Let's calmly talk about this. Let's handle this. There's no, there's no need to respond with that level because that's how things escalate. One person yells. When the next person starts yelling and use of profanity, things of that nature, you're not de-escalating anything. And you can talk to somebody calmly, even just by your interaction, how you look at them. That could be a way of de-escalating an event. So it's verbally, it's non-verbal gestures, all mm. types of things, and they need to learn that behavior because oftentimes they're the ones that escalate the event. Now, I want to ask you, um, when it comes to the behavior, do you think that would be because they don't understand uh, our culture, who we are? We may move our hands a certain way or may do something a certain way, and they respond because what we're hearing is that they don't have training in our culture to understand who we are. I agree with that 100%. And um, one other thing that I included is uh, community relations that they need to spend time and they should be required to do community relations. For example, if there's a high school basketball game, the high schools will pay for police um presence at the basketball game right mm -hmm. well some officers need to step in step into the crowd start talking to our youth work with them um go to the boys and girls club go to the ymca go to, into these programs and get to know our youth on a personal level if this is an area that you're responsible for patrolling then you need to know the youth in the area hmm. i don't want the time the first time you see them is when they're looking down the barrel of your gun. Mm -hmm. They need to see you on the streets. They need to see you in their personal community because that's where you're going to run into them, in their community. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, bullet points. The next one we had was conflict uh, resolution training. Um, conflict resolution training because sometimes if the issue is between two people, again, that's a little different between de-escalation because you want to be able to talk to the two people and sometimes you can solve that or at least bring it to a level where we could come mm. to a peaceful peaceful um final decision and not just allowing that to get out of hand mm. so basically uh the george floyd case was a similar to what you're talking about basically that got completely out of control but literally like also that was by design as well but that is a similar case right there as uh something that got actually de-escalated uh, escalated perhaps to a whole nother level of death and that has been going on for quite some time uh definitely especially when you look at and this is another thing um, understanding what your job is. Your job is to detain someone. And that is all. It is not your job to determine whether they're guilty. That is the judicial process. It is not your job to prosecute them out in the streets and say, whatever you did deserves for you to be shot. 
killed, choked, or whatever you're mm-hmm. leading these people to. It is not your job. So they're acting not only as the police officer, but they're also acting as a prosecutor, the judge, and the jury, wow. and committing that murder on the streets. And they're performing all of their roles. They're supposed to allow these people the people that they're arresting, their subjects, their day in court. And they're making all these decisions, and that's what we want to bring them back to. What is your job and what is your role in the Justice Department? And this is what you should be doing. Hmm. Wow, good information. And uh, when we come back after the break, I'm, I'm going to ask you pretty much, uh, has this whole system that they are portraying now taken over, taken charge of all of these roles? Is this by design or is it just pure racist? Uh, listen, we're going to take a break and... Uh, uh, Miss T, we're going to be back after this. Don't touch that dial. You're listening to Get With The Program Radio Show. I'm your host, Gary Jones, and we'll be right back after this. Hello, and welcome back to Get With The Program Radio Show. Again, I'm your host, Gary Jones. Uh, today, we're joining a conversation with Talisha Taylor. Talisha is an advocate for justice, and I mean an advocate for justice. Today, we're talking about law enforcement accountability, and uh, the LEA Act is an act that, she's, uh, that she has written and uh of course, she is enforcing it herself, and she's going to get this thing passed. We're going to go ahead and claim that. How about that? Yes. Welcome back to the show. All right. Now, before we took the break, we, we did talk about racial profiling training. But now let's touch a little bit about protest response training, because a lot of policemen are not prepared for protests. We saw that recently in, in, uh, in Washington, D.C. They definitely weren't prepared for it. Uh, I don't know if they weren't prepared because they didn't know or it was by design or by planning, but they weren't prepared. And I've seen it in some different other uh, uh, riots and uh, and protests they're not prepared so and and the, and the aura of the excitement of it they need training so tell me about that your take on that well the key thing here is first of all understanding what is a protest because um the biggest problem i saw this summer during the um marches for black, black lives matter is they didn't understand the difference between a protest and a riot We have a right to protest in the United States. It's covered under the Constitution. However, rioting is on a completely different level. And the way you respond to both should be specific to what is actually going on. So people have a right to protest as long as it's a peaceful protest. And many protests begin that way. But some of the responses was a riot response so we want to make sure the police are trained on both so that they understand and another key point is when the protest became a riot if they feel that they need to respond with riot training then we need to indicate and they need to make an announcement that at this time this protest is being classified as a riot and give people enough time to evacuate the premises instead sometimes we saw police officers that was actually inciting the riot we see other groups that are involved in this protest and they came just for the purpose of inciting a riot so if you give people an opportunity to evacuate the scene or the um area then you can do a riot response which would be Um, unfortunately, the use of tear gas and possibly rubber bullets. But in your training, we also have to look at the training. Rubber bullets were never intended to be fired directly at someone. They were intended to be fired at the ground on an angle. They were intended to be fired in the air. And that's all a part of the training that we need to give them. Anytime you aim it directly at someone, then you're not following the proper training for that particular um, equipment. So we definitely want to make sure that they're not responding to a riot with a peaceful protest. So when we look at that insurgence that took place at the Capitol, there was no riot response, but that was clearly a riot. They had, um, they had um, weapons. You are not allowed to have a weapon at a protest. And if you're carrying a weapon, then that's what starts to classify it as a riot. So we need to make sure that there's a big, clear difference and their response is actually appropriate. Mm -hmm. Because that was going to be my next question. My next question was going to be the difference between a protest and a riot. And I think you just answered that. One is when you have weapons. If weapons are involved, that is more like a riot. Yes. Wow. So that's intent. If it's the intent to cause 
harm, which we know was the case with the um, insurgents at the Capitol. They actually had a noose and they intended to go bring two people out to actually put on there. So that was um, harmful intent. And that has a lot to do with it. But if a protest is trying to um, push a point or an act or law, then that's the difference. Do you think that also that police can as uh, as well ignite a riot? You think they can just their presence? Um, do they ignite riots? It depends, because in some cases they physically in, um, ignited a riot. We had a police officer to throw them breaking windows, um, physically doing things. And that's part of it. Now, their presence, if it. I think it depends, too, even on their gear. Mm -hmm. During uh, Black Lives Matter, they was in full tactical gear. And that could be part of a presence and a message they're sending out that we're, we're prepared to respond to you in a violent manner because we're expecting you to be violent. So even in their attire, I think that has a lot to do with mm -hmm. it. Now, another one of your bullet points here was um, use of force continuing program. Uh, I, under that, I also have restraint training, equipment training, because mm -hmm. there's different types of use of force where, for example, if someone's running away from you, there is a piece of equipment that you can aim at their feet that's going to tangle them up. They're going to fall down and now they're immobile and cannot move. Those are some of the other things that you can do instead of shooting someone who's running away from you in the back. So that's what we want to do when we start talking about um, restraint with out force and those are some of the trainings that they also need to be exposed to this is good stuff here now also people with disabilities or mental health crisis you you recommended that training as well uh, i can definitely uh, uh agree with you on that because a lot of people that are disabled are getting shot and getting killed and they're disabled have mental uh situations here what is your take on that um we have People with physical disabilities, a man who was a paraplegic asked to be ste asked to step out of a car. He indicates to them what the problem is. They drag him out of the car. And that's what I meant by people with disabilities. I cannot physically stand up. I can't physically do what you're asking me to do. And there is no understanding. So that's why we want to make sure they're trained so that they understand the physical incapacities of some people. M mental illness is a different, definitely big um, issue. And again, it's just going back to that crisis, someone being in a crisis and being able to handle that. I can't wait for this to get out. Before we move any further, how can somebody uh, read this act, get a copy of it? Where do they go to, to, uh, to get the response from this? Uh, right now, it's on change.org. You can pull it up. Um, if you go to Google and do a search, Law Enforcement Accountability Act, and the letters are L-E-A-A, -A, L -E -A, a And if you type that in, you'll be able to go right to the change.org, and you can click on the entire 12-page document and read through every detail. Mm -hmm. Well, wow, there you have it for my listeners. I had to make sure we get that plug in right there uh, because we need to know about this. I think this is a wonderful thing that uh, Ms. Taylor's doing uh, for the community as well and actually for the nation. This, to me, really should be a nationwide uh, uh, federal thing. This should just go right in because that's what you're aiming at, right? Exactly. That's, aiming exactly. At, right? that's the design. Mm -hmm. Wow. So right now, where are you with the now? Is it, uh, and how long have you been pushing this act so far? Um, I wrote it during the summer, so I spent a couple months and it's not my background so I had to do a lot of research for example why didn't we ban tear gas um, because that's been a prior uh, argument since the Geneva Convention we're one of the only we're the only country that actually allows it so I didn't want that to be something that holds this entire act up so that's why they have to have the riot training versus the protest so that they can only release it during a riot but there's steps to declaring a riot prior to actually utilizing those forces. So there's things we didn't want to hold up the act, but we want to be able to actually um, get, get it approved. And I just felt that as Americans, we must be the change we want to see. Mm -hmm. No one addressed it. No one wrote anything that was going to actually address these issues. And sometimes as a mother, 
um, as a mother of an Afro-American male, I understand exactly what these young men are going through. And even some young ladies, we just need to write the plan ourselves. And the where, where I need help, I need everyone to look at it and sign it. Once we have um, the proper support and we have enough signatures, then we need to just take it to our president and ask him to sign it. Mm -hmm. And that's how it becomes a law because we can't, it's just not something that's becoming active. We have a lot of people in position. We have a lot of congressmen. They're not writing any laws for us to address this. We saw what they um, wrote and it just wasn't comprehensible. It's still, um, these things are still, these issues, these incidents are still continuing to happen. We need to get this done, need to do it ourselves. So I know it's a big act that I took upon my shoulders, but if I don't do it, then I can't say that I haven't participated in any way. Wow, that's good information. What we're going to do here, Ms. Taylor, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk more. And more importantly, I want to ask you, uh, who have you sent the act to and why haven't they responded? We're going to put that right out there. Listen, uh, you listen to Get With The Program Radio Show. I'm your host, Gary Jones. Now we're going to reach out to my good friend, Steve Rao. And listen, don't touch that dial. We'll be right back after this. Okay, Steve Rao, once again, appreciate you being here today, man. This is a question I have for you, Mr. Rao. Why is it that when uh, Asian Indian people, Egypt people, why y'all get the jobs before we do? What's going on, Steve Rao? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just messing with no, you. No, no. I mean, Go ahead. I'll I, keep I, it. I think that, uh, first of all, Gary, immigrants that come from India are coming from the top echelon of society. They've been educated so intensely in science and math and engineering that when they come to America, they're just dying to get those jobs where, that uh, Americans don't have the skills for. We, we, we're not producing enough engineers and scientists. So they're able to come here into medicine, into engineering, and they're just flourishing and thriving. But we can learn from that. We can make more investments in our universities. You know, and uh, I think that's why they're, they're, they're getting a lot of jobs. But I think we need to make sure that we're providing other opportunities for Americans that pay the taxes. And we have to do a better job of doing that. Hey, listen, I'm Gary Jones, host and producer of Get With The Program Radio Talk Show. You're listening to the talk show at its best. Don't touch that dial. We keep our ear to the community. So don't touch that dial. We got more coming right here on Get With The Program Radio Talk Show. Hello and welcome back to Get With The Program Radio Show. Again, I'm your host, Gary Jones. Now listen, today we are joined in a conversation with Talisha Taylor. Now again, Talisha is an advocate for justice in so many ways. Trust me when I tell you, she has an act that she has written and we are talking about that today, basically surrounding law enforcement accountability. Hello and welcome back, Talisha. Welcome. Now before we took the break, I, I wanted to ask you, I think I did mention, you think this whole, the, the, everything that the police officers you think it's by design or it's just plain straight out racist? Some of it is racist. And then the fact that they've been allowed to perform their duty in this mannerism has made it become so common that they've accepted this role and they really need to go back. That's why I said we need this DOJ um national training for them to understand what their real role is because they're stepping outside of those guidelines mm -hmm. so what i'm hearing these police officers need training that's that's, that's basically they need a lot more training that's well what I'm the reason we're going to give them the training is because i believe that some of them understand exactly what they're doing wrong however it is necessary to put this in the law that they go through this training so that now we can hold them accountable. It was understood during the law enforcement um, act that they would behave in a manner that would uphold the law. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're not doing. So now we're realizing we need to actually be specific mm -hmm. and say these are things you should not do, because if we don't, then there's all these loopholes and that's how they keep getting acquitted. But if we list this directly and specifically, now we can address them for missing these key points and we actually have something to actually hold them accountable for. Mm -hmm. what, what would be a suggestion uh, based on monetary issues? What would you think would be a suggestion to slow the process of how they're acting? Because you know we hit people in the pockets. Game change. 
Definitely. Well, part of the licensure, um, we were speaking about the DOJ training manual and we might get back into it, but that's only one part of the licensure. The second thing would be that they need to definitely have a psychiatric review. Mm. They, they're going to be held accountable for everything that they cover in the training because they're actually going to do a certification assessment before they're allowed to actually be a police officer. In addition to that, a background check to make sure they're not affiliated with any of these neo-Nazi or any type of racist groups. And finally, they need to be able to have something that I've put into the act is an excessive force insurance. You have insurance as a driver. You're responsible for driving your car. You must carry insurance, malpractice insurance. You must have if you're a doctor. So again, we have this group of people who are who have the opportunity, unfortunately, to cause harm, then they need to have excessive force and neglect insurance so that they will think twice about just using it as an option and they'll use it as a last resort, which is the way it was intended to be. And a lot of people may think, yes, but you don't understand. They be maybe face to face with, you know, someone in the act of committing a violent crime. That's not what we're talking about. We're really talking about um, neglect. That's when you're looking at these individuals who are um, innocent, who haven't done a crime, that they're putting these um, death penalties on in the streets. And that's why we need the malpractice insurance. It'll make them think twice. And if they're violating um, another part of that licensure is a five point program. And it actually has levels and specific details for each level. And if they're violating these things, then they need to be held, be held accountable. And maybe we need to financially address what they're doing because mm -hmm. it's mal, like I said, it's neglect. Mm -hmm. Now, when we're talking about making sure that they're properly trained and holding them accountable, uh, do we also need to consider uh, the hierarchy of this whole thing, the people who are in charge of them? Because up top, it very well could be a whole racist issue up top because some people look out for people. So how do we hold the people up top accountable? Included in the law is a point for the law enforcement agency. So you are responsible for every single one of your officers. And when your officers are securing these points, we have um, early intervention systems. We need to see that put into place. Have you addressed this with this officer? What has been the result? What has changed? You can't just sit there turning your um, eye or back to these situations and continue to allow them to happen. So in addition to that, they're going to be held accountable because they're going to get a review every two years. Mm -hmm. The public will be able to see it because it's going to be um, a public review. And in the event that they get um, graded as under review, it's possible the same way you have um, the state taking over schools, the state can take over your police district. Mm -hmm. And if it's the state level police district, then we're looking at nationally taking it over. And that's what we're going to do to help hold them accountable for what's happening happening in their community mm. and we don't want to turn our eye to sometimes we could have good police agencies they're going to be rewarded for that as well so it's not just hey we're attacking the bad no the system actually has um points put in for promotions and things like that mm. but districts that are actually doing what they need to do and when the state takes over, it can be moving a police chief all the way down to a complete haul of the entire system. So based on that um, evaluation, they'll decide what level we need to address this entire system. And by doing it every two years, we don't want this to prolong and we don't want to get so far in depth with this, um, I guess, yearly and hidden um, systemic racism and whatever you have inside that district, we want to address it, like I said, every two years so that when we start to see them declining, we can address it then before it gets bad. Mm -hmm. Now, do you see, based on the information here uh, with the injustice of the police department and uh, different officers, do you see in the future that perhaps police may not exist? That I don't think because um, there still needs to be community. Um, there still need to be people in the community addressing crimes as they occur. It should be someone that you can call in the event that you have a problem. 
Um, but right now, the way things are, like I said, that whole de-escalation, sometimes they make a problem even worse than what it really could have been, which is why one of the things they need to do is um, crisis training, because sometimes you have people who are mentally ill that can be having a crisis, and um, we're over when they say defund the police, we don't mean to take money and resources. We need some um, body trained in mental health that can come to the scene with the police officer. And maybe their job is to help the police officer. Instead of sending uh, 20 police officers out, you want to have someone who's certified as a therapist or a Psych, uh, psychiatric help assistance, mental health, to actually go out to these areas to help someone when they're in a health crisis. Mm -hmm. And they're treating them like criminals, and that sometimes results in possible death or arrest or mm. um, bodily harm for these people. And sometimes it could just be that they're having a mental health breakdown. Mm -hmm. Now, I uh, noticed one of your other topics here, racial profiling training. Uh, we definitely need that because racial profiling has been a big problem for years and it still is a problem. So training for that, how important is that? It's extremely important because there is a difference between racial profiling and criminal profiling. Criminal profiling, somebody robs a store. He was wearing a red hat. He's five foot. He, you know, he has green hair. He's got a leprechaun hat on. So that's what you're looking for. However, racial profiling is, why is this um, Afro-American driving down the street? Is music too loud? That's racial profiling. But we understand that if a police report comes across and you hear a specific detail for someone, that's who you're looking for. So they need to understand the difference between the two because sometimes when you start talking about these laws and what you want to see done, they'll, yeah, but we have to do it. No, there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. So that's why that particular piece is added into the training. And again, it holds them accountable for understanding the difference between the wow. two. Has racial profiling, has it gotten any better or the numbers are still the same? Um, the numbers are still the same. The Leah Act actually will hold them accountable again for all of these stops. And this is going to be a way to start tracking police, individual law enforcement agency officers mm -hmm. who are victims, uh, who are actually making people victims of racial profile and who want to go around and just, you know, not hold their job in that regard. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's interesting, interesting conversation, Miss uh, Miss T. Listen, what we're going to do, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we want to talk about as well as protest respond training. We want to talk about that as well. Listen, don't touch that dial. We're going to be right back after this. Good day, Gary. Here's a highlight in black history. Jesse Russell is an African-American inventor born April 26, 1948 in Nashville, Tennessee. He has over 100 patents granted or in process and continues to invent in the area of next generation broadband, wireless networks, technologies and services known as 4G. He is known for his invention of the digital cellular base station and the fiber optic microcell utilizing high power linear amplifier technology and digital modulation techniques which enable new digital services for cellular mobile users. As a top honor student, he became the first African American to be hired directly from a historically black college and university by AT&T Bell Laboratories. He established and led an innovation center focused on applied research and advanced communication technologies, which made it possible for AT&T to extend its existing portfolio of services and expand it to new businesses and markets. His idea to digitize the speech, reduce the bandwidth per user, along with the use of modulation schemes, has taken a $100 million business to a $5 billion business. He led the first team from Bell Laboratories to introduce digital cellular technology in the United States. Jesse Russell is Chairman and CEO of INC Networks Incorporated. This concludes today's highlight in black history. Oh yeah, I definitely gotta thank Ursula Camille for bringing us the moments of black history, things that have happened, inventions that have gone on with African Americans. But now listen, I'm gonna reach out to Grave Digger, comedian Grave Digger, tell me what's going on in your world. I, I got some stuff going on right now. I mean, everybody wearing masks, that's the thing killing me. Everybody wearing masks. Now, 
it's a good thing that a lot of y'all and you know some of your friends are wearing masks and you glad of it and it got nothing to do with COVID because they had bad breath. I mean, bad breath. Now, I'm going to be able to tell you right now, I'm telling you right now, how you know your breath stinks. If you got on a mask and you walk up to one of your friends and he offer you another one while you got one on, you know your breath stinks. But I'm going to tell you right now, they got masks now. I'm coming out myself. I'm going to make a million dollars in one day. I'm coming out with scented masks. I'm going to tell you right now, all since on the outside. I don't care about the COVID. I just want to keep your breath out of my nose. But, hey, like I said, Garrett, Garrett this is 2021. I'm bringing them to it. I'm bringing them to it hard. Love you. Y'all keep listening to my man, Garrett. Peace. Hey, listen, I'm Gary Jones, host and producer of Get With The Program Radio Talk Show. You listen to the talk show at its best. Don't touch that dial. We keep our ear to the community, so don't touch that dial. We got more coming right here on Get With The Program Radio Talk Show. Good information, Camille and Grave Digger, you guys off the chain, man. Thank you for that information. Appreciate it so much. Listen, once again, welcome back, Miss Taylor. Thank you, thank you. All right. Now, before we took the break, I had a very important question I want to ask you, and that's sometimes it's putting people on the spot because I want to know what's going on. And, and uh, so you've uh, presented this to some politicians already. Have you already sent this out and trying to get some awareness? And who and why did they respond? Why didn't they? I sent it to quite a few people, and I, I don't want to say that they ignored it i think a lot of people sent in information everybody thought they had a solution to the problem so i'm i'm going to say that i'm hoping they had so many emails that it was just an over fluctuation of that but i've sent it to the entire black congressional caucus Mm -hmm. to um every member of Congress. I've sent it to specific governors and some mayors of large cities. I've sent it to some police chiefs that I saw doing uh, well just to see if maybe I would get a response from them. Black Lives Matter to the, um, I'm going to say, I guess, the religious communities. I sent it to some religious leaders and I haven't heard anything from anyone. I sent it to some um, shows, for example, The View, The Talk, The Real. Okay. And I guess it's hard to reach them because maybe they just see so much, but I was hoping and I've sent multiple responses out. And that's why I said we just have to be the change we want to see. And perhaps one day the right eyes will look at it and maybe we'll get what we're actually trying to see. Now, I do want to ask you in reference to that, is there something else out in the community or out in the justice system like this? Is this original? Is this something? Is it some other programs that are already in place? I wrote this. This is all original work from me. But parts of it are, um, for example, there's like banned chokeholds. Um, that small piece of it is um, some acts and laws that people want to create in their community. And I see some congressmen, representatives, things of that nature, trying to push little small pieces. But again, my keyword was comprehensive. I think the entire system needs to be designed because it's so far in depth that right now there's a serious problem that we need to address. So there are bits and pieces. Some of it's not new, but comprehension is the key. Now, this is a rhetorical question. Do you think that if this act is not put in place um, and perhaps some other uh, other acts or other even important concerns such as this, do you think we possibly could see another George Floyd case? Every day, yes. Uh, and we still see it. Again, I have the Law Enforcement Accountability Act on Facebook, and I'm continuously posting something almost every day. So we still see the same actions continuing. You know, I had a gentleman to ask me the other day, um, which, uh, which leader would I follow if I was in the earlier years of civil rights? Uh, and my choices was Malcolm X or Dr. Martin Luther King. Well, I, I, I chose both of them, but I, I leaned towards more of another. Which one would you lean towards more? I mean, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to say both I, like you did. I'm, be, I'm even going to throw in Nat Turner. <laughs> I'm gonna say, oh, wow. I'm going to say both like you did. Um, there's steps to handling a problem. And the first step is to bring it to their attention. We've brought it to their attention. Like I said, we've marched. We march. And 
the this summer the headlines um the youth burnt the city down the country's on fire that still was not enough and now we need to understand that at this point we've brought the attention it wasn't enough to create to, to address the actual problem so now we need to go after the laws and that's what people didn't understand that you can't just change a law without showing the reason it needs to be changed the reason is already out there so now i think that we've already done our um dr king marches we've actually already done our Malcolm X address, burn the nation down, but still there's nothing that's changed. So now we need to actually go where we need to see the change and make sure the laws are changed. And I, and I truly agree with you with that because I find that even with marches and protests, uh, I've seen often from a media perspective is that um, most cases protests will happen weeks, two weeks, a month. And then after everything calms down, it disappear and the same thing still exists. So I, I guess does protest really work? They work because you have to bring attention to the fact that it's a problem. If I wrote this law and we never had the protest, half of the people seen the protest, they see all these cases and they still don't think it's a problem. However, there are some people who are not um, victims who actually say, wait a minute, this is going on. So we have to have the protest to bring it to, to bring the necessary attention. And then I think we need to go ahead and do what's necessary to change the laws. Now, Ms. Taylor, how important do you think the media is? When it comes to uh, your act, I think the media is extremely important because I need to get the word out. I need people to actually look at it, read it, and I need the support. And right now, it's small, small, it's moving very slowly. So hopefully, we can get some eyes on it. The right person might pick it up and draw the attention to it. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now, I notice you have um, shooting at an unarmed subject. Uh, that's another one of your bullet points because we get a lot of that uh, shooting at unarmed subjects and shooting in shooting uh, at a vehicle or moving vehicles, just shooting. Uh, this whole shooting situation has gotten out of control. And I don't know if it's really whether a police officer, uh, even if he's been trained, we find some that have been trained, but yet they still do it. So I'm concerned with that. I'm 100 percent concerned with you as well. And oftentimes there's other people in the vehicle and sometimes they're children under the age of five or less in the vehicle. And that's why we need to actually look at it. Because, again, what is your reason for detaining? Why do you have to shoot into the vehicle? Do you need to stop the car? You shoot at the tires. There's so many other options out there. And sometimes the reason for shooting in the re vehicle is not because you're stopping a, um, it should be a life or death situation. And oftentimes it's not. So they need to relook at reasons and rationale for shooting into a vehicle. And, ha and like I said, most times is no reason for them to actually do such so we want to talk about and shooting at an unarmed suspect if someone's running away from you there is no reason and they're unarmed to use force against that person at all but we've saw this summer videos of countless times when we've seen this action take place so it's definitely something that again we have to put on the table as part of that training and that's how we hold them accountable for it now i noticed in some instances i've seen uh two police officers in a car at one time and one police officer acts out in a uh, a bad uh, a bad way bad behavior you know mm -hmm. period does all of the things that you were talking about they need training for now what about the officer that's sitting in the car that sees this but he doesn't do anything about it should he be held accountable well, there's a clause that says duty to intervene. And when something's taking place and that officer is using excessive force, if you witness it and you do not intervene, then you can actually be charged on your license due, due to your lack of involvement. So I also have that in the um, law as well. Mm -hmm. Now, background checks. I know we're getting off topic here a little bit. The background checks for the police officers. How important is that? Because some of the background checks are not done properly. Should we have a specific agency or do you think the agencies that are doing it now are, are pretty comprehensive? Well, 
when I said that we need to do an overhaul, it's because I think that this needs to be a national, um, federal, mm-hmm. supported by the Department of Justice, actually held. So they'll be the ones doing the background checks. Um, they'll be the ones putting out the list of um, doctors that can actually do the psychiatric review, review. So you can't just go to somebody you know and somebody that knows you or went to school with your dad or your uncle. No, you have to go to, to the people that are on this list who are actually bonded with the federal government to actually do these um, psychiatric reviews in a proper way. Wow, good information. That's going to about wrap it up for us. Do you have any last words or concerns about your act here? Uh, no, my only um, last concern is that I really would like for you to read it. There's some things in there, even about citizens' arrest. That's a big one. People, um, citizens are accountable for their actions as well. And also verbally filing false police reports. And we're going to call that the Karen or Ken Act because it addresses people who actually do that as well. So I need your support. I need your signatures. Please look it up. The Law Enforcement Accountability Act, LEA. A-A. That's it. Thank you so much, Ms. Talisha Taylor. Once again, we'll join in there in the conversation with Ms. Talisha Taylor, who is an advocate for justice. Today, we talked about a lot of stuff concerning law enforcement accountability. Talisha, thank you so much for joining me today. You're welcome. All right. Once again, you're listening to Get With The Program Radio Show. I'm your host, Gary Jones. As I always say, stay positive, keep your head up, and remember to... Get With The Program. What you talking about? The Program. It starts now. Now. Now.